I can't say there was one particular moment, right? But I remember over a period of years, things were coming up and the whole diet and nutrition thing wasn't enough to help my patients. Just nutrition's great, movements, sorry, I say diet and nutrition, I mean nutrition and movements, which is basically what the whole discussion around health gets polarized and just, it's all about food, it's all about movement. Those things are important, but I realized for many patients, they simply weren't enough. Yeah. And so a couple of things I guess from my practice, I've noticed one particular patient I saw, I still remember this super clearly, right? He had type 2 diabetes. I think he was maybe, I'm going to guess late 40s, early 50s. He had type 2 diabetes. He saw my TV show. He'd read some of my blogs. He'd read some other health blogs on the internet. And he thought, wow, maybe I can do something with my diet to help my type 2 diabetes, right? So he went on to what most people would call a low-carb diet, okay? Now, I say most people would call, I'm sort of, I'm not a huge fan of that term. And the reason I'm not a huge fan of that term, even though many of my friends use it, is because I think it's very simplistic. I think we have demonized fat for many years and I think we are potentially doing the same thing with carbs now, unless we have a bit more context and a bit more nuance. But this guy, he went on what would be called a low carb diet. He really cut down his refined and processed carbohydrates, fantastic and he was starting to get an improvement in his blood sugar. Now, he was doing this just from you know, reading information on the internet. He was empowering himself and making a change, but he was getting frustrated because his blood sugar wasn't coming down anymore. It had plateaued, and he was trying to cut his carbs even more to figure out, oh, it must be, I must, I must not be doing it right. I need to cut back more. Yeah. And anyway, he ends up in my door. He ends up in my clinic, and he says, hey, look, Dr. Chatterjee, I've been doing this, um, I'm still on metformin, which is a, a blood sugar drug. I've really got my sugar under control, but I can't get it any lower and it's frustrating me. And I was looking at his life and I thought, hey man, this guy is stressed out. He is a busy executive, he's working late every night, he's not sleeping well. All kinds of other things are going on and I actually think he's stressing himself out more, trying to cut carbs even more. And so, you know, I spent a bit of time trying to understand what was going on. And it was quite clear to me that stress was the primary issue, but he was resistant. I said, look, we need to really work on your stress levels. When you are stressed out, that will raise your blood sugar. I don't think this is any longer a diet issue. I think this is a stress issue. You've made great changes in your diet, well done. But focusing overly on that area, you're missing the big picture. Yeah. So all you had to do was some simple things, right? I helped him over the course of a few weeks to switch his computer off, his work computer off for an hour before bed. I mean, he was literally doing work emails in bed because he had so much to do. He was resistant at start, at the start, so I started with 10 minutes, and then he gradually was starting to feel the difference. He went up to an hour. He was also killing it in the gym. What I mean by that is, he was a busy exec, working hard, rushing hard, you know, always on the go. When he went into the gym, he would go to a, like a really intense spinning class. And I said, hey, look, I think you're tired. I think your body is deplete. What I'd love you to do is, yeah, sure, work out, but maybe let's work on yoga for a few weeks. Let's really work on a type of exercise that restores you and is not depleting you. Yeah. Now, I'm not against spinning, right? But it's about the right form of exercise and movement in the context of the rest of your life. Yeah. So he was a bit resistant, but he agreed. So basically, he switches off before he goes to bed. He cuts down the technology. I teach him some breathing techniques, like one that I call a three, four, five breathing technique. When you breathe in for three, you hold for four, you breathe out for five. And he switched the spinning classes for yoga. Within six to eight weeks, his blood sugar started coming down. And maybe six to 12 months later, it had come right back down to normal. He didn't change his diet. And I told him, actually, you can eat more carbs than you currently are. Just relax a little bit, have some more whole food carbs. I think you're going way too extreme for what you need. So that's just one, I've got so yeah. many yeah. stories, but that's one case where I thought, hey, it's not all about food and movements. There are, t for me, I said there are two other big pieces, the sleep, which obviously you're an expert on, or you're an expert on all the whole wellness space, but sleep is a big issue. Yeah. But I think stress is an issue that people, as you've already said, people are not talking about it enough. Yeah. That's why I wrote the book. I want to give stress the airtime it deserves so people start to take this thing seriously. And, you know, to give you another example, Sean, what happens every January? 
right? In the US and the UK, what are people trying to do? They're trying to cut down on sugar. They're trying to cut down on alcohol. Now, here's the thing. If you, in January, if you say to yourself, hey, look, I've, this is the year I'm going to do it. This is the year I'm going to get my life on track. I'm, I'm cutting down on the sugar this time. I'm cutting down on my alcohol. What I see happen in my clinic is this. For one week, people use willpower. They're fine. They can do it. Two weeks, they might be okay. Even three weeks, they might be fine. But then they start to go back to their existing behaviors. And I see that often we use alcohol, often we use food and things like sugar to soothe the stress in our life. Mm. So if I don't deal with the underlying stress in their life, I can't change the behavior. So look, I don't like giving these things a rank of importance. I think food, nutrition, movement, sleep, yeah. stress are all important. Yeah. But if people are listening to this podcast and they have tried to change their nutrition and they can't make it stick, maybe it's because they're using food to help deal with the stress in their life. Mm, I love it, yeah, so powerful. And I think that all of those components you just mentioned, it depends on the time of year, it depends on the day, it depends on the person, it depends on so many factors, it's unique. And it's really, um, it's an interesting kind of ebb and flow. You know, Sometimes other things are gonna get more attention than others. But stress, and I'm so glad you mentioned this, that you are popularizing this conversation about it because it's so overlooked. Now you mentioned something about you know, changing some things with his lifestyle, not the food, and getting his helping to support his blood sugar and coming down. How exactly can stress affect our blood sugar in the first place? Yeah, look, Sean, that's a fantastic question. And I think the, the best way to answer that is to really explain clearly and concisely what the stress response is, right? The stress response is fundamentally there to keep us safe. That is ultimately what it's there to do. So let's rewind two million years ago. Right, two million years ago, we would be in our hunter-gatherer communities, in our tribes, okay? We're getting on with our business, doing whatever we're doing. If a wild predator is approaching like a lion, then we suddenly start to change. What happens? We're scared. We think, okay, there's a predator, attack. Uh, there's a predator approaching. In an instant, our stress response kicks into gear, right? So what happens? A series of physiological changes kick into place when that happens, your blood sugar starts to rise. Why? Because then more glucose can go to your brain, which is what you need in an emergency situation. Right. Your blood pressure starts to go up, so more oxygen can get to your brain. That's gonna help you get away from the lion, right? Your amygdala, which is the emotional part of your brain, that goes on to high alerts. So you are hypervigilant for all the threats around you. That is an appropriate response when you're in danger. Your blood, Right? Your blood starts to become more prone to clotting. That's great because if you get attacked by that lion and you get cut, instead of bleeding to death, your blood's going to clot and that's going to save your life. Right. So in the short term, these things are super helpful. The problem today is that many of us are having our stress responses activated, not by wild predators, but by our daily lives, mm. by our email inboxes, by our to-do lists, by our competing demands, by... Two parents working, one's trying to rush home to pick somebody up and take them to a sports class. Elderly parents we might have to look after. For many of us, our bodies are reacting in the same way. So those things that work so beautifully well in the short term, like your blood sugar going up, if that's happening day in, day out to your life, well, that's gonna lead to low energy. It's gonna lead to obesity and type two diabetes, right? Because stress raises your blood sugar. That's the reason it does it. Mm. It's not just food, it's not just movement. As you know yourself, Sean, uh, sleep deprivation raises your blood sugar. But everyone's still just talking about food when we need to broaden out that conversation. Blood pressure is a big problem these days. Again, I've just shown people how blood pressure, your blood pressure going up if you're running away from a line is appropriate. If you're at the gym and you're doing a spinning class, your blood pressure will go up. That's an appropriate response to a short-term stressor. It's these things are becoming long-term. That's where the problem is coming about. And that emotional part of your brain, the amygdala, which I told you about, which goes on to high alert when you're stressed, that is an appropriate response if a predator is attacking. If you are in downtown LA tonight and it's dark and you think someone might be following you, you want your emotional brain to go on to high alert. You want to be hypervigilant. Right. But if that's happening day in, day out to your email inbox, that's what we call anxiety. 
So the stress response, once we understand it, we start to realize the studies show that 90% of what a doctor sees in any given day may in some way be related to stress, which is a remarkable figure. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a great segue into, you talk about these MSDs, right? These micro stress doses. Because for me, immediately a thought comes up, well, those are small things. You know, the email inbox, the, the rushing to get my kid to their practice, but it's all of those things combined. Like that's not a line coming your way, but it adds up. Is that right? Absolutely. And this, you know, I remember, Sean, when I um, sat down to write this book, I was trying to figure out how do you simplify stress? How do you really get across in a very simple, non-judgmental way what you're talking about? Because I think we ignore stress a bit. We, it's, we talk about it all the time. We know that we're a stressed out culture, but I'm not sure what that means. Many of us don't know what it means or what we can do about it. So the way I simplify it is this. The first thing to say is we've all got our own personal stress threshold, right? And that will vary. Yours may be different from mine. It may even vary from day to day, depending on how, how we slept and all kinds of different things. And I make the case that it's that threshold that's important. When you get to your threshold, that's when things start to go wrong. So how, can, how do I explain that even further? Well, I see we've got two kinds of stress, right? We've got macro stress doses, right? And these are the, you know, these are the really, really traumatic things that may happen. You know, this could be physical abuse. This could be uh, a bereavement. This could be a relationship breakup. You know, these things are what I call macro stresses. They are big hits of stress that we do need to process and we may need to see someone to help us with that. Yeah. But what I'm primarily talking about is the opposite of that, which are these micro stress doses, or as I call them in the book, these MSDs. Now, what is an MSD? An MSD, as you've just really demonstrated, is a small dose of stress that in isolation we can handle, right? With no problem. One of these things, I've got to pick my kids up, I need to rush there and get them, no problem. It's when they start to add up one on top of another, they get you closer and closer to your own personal stress threshold and when you hit your threshold, that's when things go wrong. That's when your back goes. That's when an innocent email from your boss suddenly becomes problematic. Mm. That's when we fall out with our partners mm. or scream at our kids because we've hit our threshold. It wasn't necessarily the last stressor in our life that caused it. That was just you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. It's the final piece that gets us to our threshold. And I make the case that many of us are leaving our house in the morning having already been exposed to 10 or 15 micro stress doses. Mm. So I'll give you an example. What is, a, what is a common scenario these days? A common scenario is people are stressed out at work. They come back late. Uh, they don't want to go to sleep because they want to unwind. They want some time for themselves. So they start watching Netflix, okay? And then one episode turns into two, which turns into three. I get that. I have done this before. I am not being, I'm not judging people for doing this. But let's say you go to bed at midnight because you finally feel that, hey, I've, I've unwound from the day and I've got to be up at 6.30 for work tomorrow. So you go to bed, right? You set your alarm for 6.30. So you go to bed and let's assume you're in a deep sleep, right? So you're in a deep sleep, your alarm goes off at 6.30 in the morning, boom, that is micro stress dose number one mm. because that's jolted you out of your deep sleep. You look at your phone, you look at it and go, ah, I've got a bit more time, let me just put snooze on. You put snooze on, six minutes later, again, the alarm goes off, micro stress dose number two. Then what might you do? You might go, oh, let me look at my phone, quickly look at email. Oh man, there's three work emails from yesterday I didn't respond to, I need to do that today. MSD number three. Then you quickly flip onto Instagram and you see, oh man, why is that person having a go at me for my last post? They're having a little niggle at me. Mm. MSD number four. Then you realize, oh man, I've been in bed for half an hour just doing this stuff. I'm gonna be late for work, I need to get up and get out. MSD number five, and you can quickly see how before we've even left the house in the morning, we've had 15 micro stress doses. Why is that a problem? That's a problem because it means you now are much closer to your own personal stress threshold. That means it won't take much in the day before you get and before you flip over. So, you know, my approach is not just about re reducing the stress in your life, because, you know, I get it. Some people have got super stressful lives. Maybe I can't reduce all the stressors in their life. You know, if you're a single mom with two kids and you're working two jobs, you know what? That is a significant amount of stress in your life. Even if you cannot remove the stress, though, 
you can make yourself more resilient by reducing how many micro stress doses you've been exposed to, but also with some simple techniques that we can all use. So I, I don't know, I think that micro stress dose is something that is really taking off in the UK. People really like that as an idea to help them identify and, and, and think about stress. Yeah, yeah, man, so powerful. Uh, it reminds me of WMDs, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. You know, these micro stress doses in the way that they influence our lives. And what's so cool is that, so for years I've been talking about a different version of this and I call it your overall stress load. And this is the first time I've seen it in book form and you detailing out like how it all can take place and just put so much on top of you and you don't even realize it. And we're really just kind of putting ourselves at a disadvantage before we even get into the day a lot of times. And so, man, so fascinating. And if you could, and th this is the first time niggle has been said on the show, by the way. What did I say? Niggle. niggle. <laughs> so, British term. Yeah. And this is, we before you even came in here, I was telling my guys, my team, I was like, yeah, he's going to have a cool accent. You know, just get ready <laughs> for it. You know, so man, thank you so much for sharing that. And if you could, I want to talk about, before we go any further, just to point out something important that obviously, and just for you to speak on this, stress isn't all bad. Yeah. Right? There's an upside to it as well. 100%. And I think we've all got to be super careful when we talk about stress. And it's a good reminder for me that not all stress is bad. Stress is normal. We need stress to perform and function. It's the right kind of stress in the right dose at the right time. You know, if you have, if, if you love your job, let's say, and you are adequately slept, you know, and your job is stressful, yeah. it may not have much of an impact. You may be thriving. You may thrive on that stress. It's like most things, right? A little bit is good. Too much is problematic. And I try and illustrate that in a, in a graph in the book so to really help people understand it. But I don't know. We can take an example. Um, yeah. What's a regular example from normal life? A cup of coffee, right? So many people use caffeine uh, to help them. Yeah, now we can argue whether it's helping them or not. Mm -hmm. That's a separate conversation. But I think we know the feeling. For those of us who are habituated to, to drinking caffeine, sometimes we need one or two cups to get us going, right? So that's a little bit of that caffeine stress, if you will, helps you perform, helps get you in the right state. Too much, if you have a couple more extra cups, two, three more, many of us know that feeling. We start to feel jittery. We start to feel anxious. It's like diminishing returns. You, you see what I mean? It's yeah, like the, the right amount can get you in the zone. Right. Too much becomes problematic. To make it scientific, uh, cortisol, which is the stress, which is the primary stress response hormone in the body, a little bit of cortisol. So if you have to give a, a public speaking event or someone listening to this has to present to their team at work and they get a bit nervous, a little bit of cortisol, like if you feel a bit stressed, helps you perform, right? You think more clearly. You can pull things out of your memory much more effectively. But too much stress, right? And your brain is fried and you, you literally cannot think and you can't perform. It's about the right amount of stress. And I think, you know, what, what does a little bit of cortisol do? It helps your brain work super well. What does too much cortisol do? It kills nerve cells in your brain's hippocampus. That's the memory center of your brain. And look, I don't say this to scare people, but we now know that chronic stress is causative in the development of Alzheimer's disease, mm. right? It's not something we think about. You know, we, yes, we're worried about it, but we don't think how our day-to-day -day actions can impact Alzheimer's. There are many other factors to consider as well, but chronic stress is one of those. And here's the thing with Alzheimer's, it doesn't just develop overnight. You don't even get it like just one year before you have symptoms. Alzheimer's disease starts 20 to 30 years before you get it in your brain. Mm. So I worry when I see the society of chronic stress, when I see the World Health Organization call stress the health epidemic of the 21st century, and, and you see the research on it with Alzheimer's, I worry that many of us, we're, we're living these busy, overloaded lives, that we take stress for granted, and we don't realize the impact it's having not only on our short-term health, but also our long somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's so true, so true. For me, it, when, when I think about beneficial stress, I immediately think of exercise. Yeah. And we know that we, our body, it's a trigger for adaptation, but when we continuously put that stress on us and we're not recovering from the stress, yeah. that's when things break down. And you share in the book so brilliantly the fact that stress actually can do the same thing. It can make your brain stronger but too much stress, too many of these micro doses or even a macro dose of stress 
can change our, literally change our brain, the structure of our brain, the performance of our brain in a negative way and will hypersensitize us to more stress. Yeah. So can you talk about that? I think it was like feed forward or something like that. It's a feed forward cycle. Look, all these things, you gotta understand that the brain is always responding to the information you feed it. It's always adapting. So the more stress you have, the more chronic and unrelating your stress is, Mm. your brain's gonna adapt to be able to function in that environment, but it, it doesn't do that good a job. I mean, when talking about what the brain, talking about how stress affects the brain, um, I think a really useful thing, a really practical way of looking at that, that people I think will resonate with is this whole idea of downtime. Okay, so I think one of the big, big problems I see in society is that we've lost downtime. Downtime has been slowly eroded away. It's been stolen from us. Every single moment of the day, if we have nothing to do, we, we pick up our phones. We're now absorbing, we're, we're, we're reading new information, we're learning new things, we're reacting to what's going on around us. If, well, we're here in Santa Monica recording this, right? If you were here, I reckon 10 years ago, and you walked into a cafe, right? Or, or a bar or a restaurant or whatever, you walked into a coffee place, let's say, and there's a queue. I bet you 10 years ago that people would be looking around, they'd be daydreaming, they might bump into a friend or a work colleague. They might be looking at the, you know, the pastries and think, oh, am I gonna have this today? Am I gonna resist? Right? But they they they'd they'd be they'd be switched off a little bit. Mm-hmm. If you go into any, if we walked out of here now and went to the, the nearest coffee place and you see the line, what is everyone doing? On their phone. We're on our phones, right? Yeah. We're on our phones. And you might ask, well, why is that a problem? The reason that's a problem is because your brain needs downtime. So We used to think, Sean, that when we switched off from a task in front of us that our brain went to sleep, but it's not true. We've realized in the last few years when we switch off, there's a part of our brain called the default mode network or the DMN that goes into overdrive, right? So what does that part of the brain do, right? It does many things, but one, two things it does, it helps you to solve problems and be more creative, Mm -hmm. right? So this is the exact reason why people so many of us have our best ideas when we go for a walk or we're in the shower. I mean, I get some of my best ideas in the shower, mm. right? Why is that? It's because, because you've switched off, your brain tries to solve problems for you, right? Is that making sense? Yeah, absolutely. It, and it's absolutely. so powerful. And downtime, we don't see the, the problem with always being on our phones, right? And always consuming information. Your brain needs downtime to thrive. Yeah. And this is why I'm so keen to say, even like, I go into a lot of uh, companies, big companies talk about employee wellness. And one of my top tips is have a tech-free lunch break, even if it's just for 15 minutes, right? Put your phone in the drawer, go outside, have a walk. It sounds so simple, right? I made a, a, a different show last year for ITV in the UK on stress. And as part of that show, we got to follow three people and we got to do... We measured their stress levels literally for three days, like minute by minute. And we were tracking what they were doing and how it was affecting their stress levels. We did something called heart rate variability monitoring on them, which I think you've covered before on the podcast. And essentially a high HRV, so a high heart rate variability is a good thing. It means that your body is able to cope and adapt to the stress around you. A low reading when your heart beats, is very much like a metronome is actually slightly problematic. It, 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 it suggests that we've had too much stress on our body and our body's not able to cope and adapt. Now, one person in particular, right, he was, I'm gonna guess he was around 40 from recollection, a 40 year old guy, he was a manager in his local company and he took his job super seriously, super, super seriously. He came in early, he worked through lunch, he stayed late, he'd go home. When he'd go home to unwind, he'd drink more alcohol than he wanted to. It was impacting his relationship with his wife, it was impacting his sleep, and he wanted help. Now, I could see on his work days that you looked at his stress readings, they would start to go up throughout the morning. At lunchtime, because he didn't take a break, they'd keep going up. By the time he left home, he'd had a huge accumulation of stress, and that would affect his relationship and and impact his alcohol habits. Hmm. All I asked him to do, Sean, was this. I said, listen, what I'd love you to do at lunchtime Put your phone in your drawer for 15 minutes and go for a walk. Right? He goes, yeah, okay, I can do that, fine. He goes and does that for about a week. The following week, we retrack everything. 
what happens? You see on those work days, his stress levels go up in the morning as before. At lunchtime, they go right back down to baseline. They reset. And in the afternoon, they hardly go up to anywhere near the same level. So what does that do? That means that when he goes home, it has a knock-on consequence. So look, objectively with the data, I've seen a big difference. But what's more interesting to me is subjectively, what does he think? What does he feel? Not what does the, the tech say? He says, Doc, I feel like a different person. I've got more energy. I'm more productive in the afternoon. I'm now leaving earlier than I'm meant to finish. I'm leaving home early. I'm drinking less alcohol and I'm closer with my wife now, right? From a 15 minute lunch wow. break. And this, I'm so keen to make health accessible to people. Like wellness, I think has become, for many people, they think, oh, that's great, but it's, it's expensive, it's inaccessible. Every single one of us has the ability to have a 15 minute tech-free lunch break every day. And I guarantee if people are skeptical, try it for seven days and see the difference. Yeah. Because yes, that, that's the kind of a story which you can sort of think about, but your brain, your default mode network, it wants to help you. It wants to be more creative. It wants to help solve problems for you, but you can't do that unless you give it downtime. Yeah, it's so valuable. The The problem with it though, is that it's too simple. It's too simple. You know, it's too simple. And listen, there was a, and I mentioned this on a past episode, um, if, if especially a lot of people that listen to the show, they're wanting to perform at a high level in all the areas of their lives. And if you're talking about that work performance, if you're talking about tapping into that creativity, like you mentioned, and problem solving, the idea that not pressing and beating yeah. ourselves down, instead unplugging, it's, it's, it seems counterintuitive. But here's the thing, and this was Stanford University, they found that just a simple 15 minute walk, 11 to 15 minutes, increased something called divergent thinking, which is this thinking wow. outside the box by 60% for the test subjects you know, just getting out and going for a walk. So that tip of unplugging, and so what I've done just personally in my own life is, because you gotta consciously yeah. have yourself do this. If I do find myself in a line, I literally, I people watch. I'll like put the phone away, because it's easy, to, it's like a slot machine yeah, in your yeah. pocket, and just be there, be present. When you get on an elevator, right? Especially if there's other people on the elevator, you know, it's kind of weird, You grab your, I, just, I just become present, you know? And taking those little small opportunities, and one of the great things that uh, since we've moved, because before I like lived in the woods, it was like a whole thing. I never know if like an animal is gonna run up on me. Mm -hmm. uh, but now like I, I live in a neighborhood and so I'll go for a 10 minute walk twice a day. And that's the one thing that I build into my days to actually unplug. And I have some great ideas when I do that. Do you, do you go without your phone? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And a matter of fact, and I wanna make this statement, it's dangerous. Like if you're walk, if you're out walking and there's like cars yeah. and all this stuff, and you've got headphones on listening to, I want you to listen to me. By the way, <laughs> but I just I want you to also be safe. You yeah. know, like I saw somebody. Uh, was it yesterday morning or or this morning? Uh, it was this morning, and so they were running by. They got their their pods in the AirPods, and just run. And there's cars just going up and down the street. And I'm just like, bro, just you know, like you could just take a little you time. Yeah you know, and just unplug, and it's gonna help your brain. I, I didn't know about that Stanford University study. That's so interesting to me, that, yeah. that just 11 to 15 minutes, yeah. and I, I suspect a lot of that will be because of this default mode network that we've been talking about, because it does help you be more creative. And, you know, when I go into these, like, companies and these big tech companies to talk to them about employee wellness, there's a tendency to go, yeah, I wanna perform better. What supplement do I need to take? You know, what do I need to do? What extra thing? Do I need to put into my life in order to perform? And often it's just simply about taking something out. And this is like, we are living in this culture now, aren't we? Look, I love Santa Monica, right? I've been here for like 10 days. You go into every shop here, you can, not every shop, but many of them, you can, you can take supplements, you can buy a coffee, it can be an activated coffee. You can get a shot of um, the latest kind of brain boosting supplement, right? I get all that. I love all that stuff, right? Don't get me wrong. I, I've, I'm, I'm interested in the research behind all that stuff, but let's just break it down. Yes, yeah. Switch your phone off for 10 minutes a day. You will get a lot of those brain enhancing benefits from just doing that. And that is free. That is accessible. You know, I, I know I said this, Sean, but I take this so seriously. I have worked with wealthy, affluent patients. I've also worked in, in deprived communities for years. And I'm super passionate that we have overcomplicated health 
and that actually good quality health advice should be available to everybody. And actually, it, if we can simplify and show you, like every single thing I've recommended in my book is free. Yeah. Right? You can buy apps to help you do th certain things if you want, but pretty much everything else is free, which means actually we just need to be empowered with the information and we need to pick one thing and go, you know, I'm going to try that one small thing for the next seven days and reassess. And so the tip that you give people, I'd say, yeah, why not mimic what Sean does for 10 minutes twice a day, go for a walk without your phone. Do it for seven days and see the impact on your well-being, on your energy, but also on your relationships around you. The other thing I think, and this is why a quarter of the book on stress is on relationships, is, and to take this theme of kind of downtime and not switching off, one of the reasons why so many of our relationships are under strain these days, and there are many reasons, but one of them is, is that even if we are with the people that we love, let's say our partners, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, or our friends, or our kids, physically, geographically, we're in the same place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know where I'm going with this? In your heads, you know, we're, we're distracted by our phones. We're a million miles away. You know, you've got a cliche now that husband and wife are lying in bed together the whole society is complaining that people aren't having enough sex and libido is a big, big issue. The cliche is, is that you're physically in the same bed together, but you could be millions of miles away because you're both looking at your own customized feeds, you know, your own uh, customized Netflix channels. You, you, you're no longer connecting in the same way. And I think it's a serious, serious problem. So I love technology as much as the next guy, right? But I think we just have to be mindful and go, hey, maybe... I'll go for a walk twice a day without my phone. Maybe like at dinner times, we're gonna have a rule where we don't have phones there. So we actually, we can connect. And they sound so simple, these things. These things were in culture until about 15 years ago. We did them naturally. That's how quickly things have actually escalated. And I think we almost just have to go back to how we lived 15, 20 years ago. And a lot of these stress problems will actually be a lot reduced. In the book, you cover some very specific areas. You talk about, uh, in these four sections, purpose, relationships, body, and mind, and some very practical things. But the one that really stood out for me and you started the book with was talking about how purpose relates to stress. And this was just fascinating for me. Immediately, I was like, yes, that's the thing. But can you just break down why you felt that was important to put into the book? Yeah, look... Um the science is pretty clear, like having, not having a sense of purpose in your life is associated with much poorer health outcomes uh, across multiple conditions. It's associated with much less happiness, lower income levels. So many things are associated with not having a sense of purpose in our lives. And I feel that fundamentally a life which has no meaning and purpose in it is inherently a stressful life, right? We can talk about all the other things, but actually not having a reason to get up in the morning, not actually knowing where you're going with your life, I think it's incredibly stressful. Now, I appreciate that even simply saying that can sound stressful to someone if they're hearing that and they're going, yeah, okay, fine, but I don't like my job. I don't like where I live. Um, what can I do about that? And so why I started the book with this, because I think it is probably one of the most important things, and Yes, of course, breathing, exercise, meditation, nature, all those things are important and I cover them all and I give practical tips in them. But I think the meaning and purpose piece is probably the most important. And I think it's one of the freshest. It's a new idea for people to latch onto. And so Sean, a few years ago, I came across this Japanese concept, Ikigai. Have you come across it before? Yeah. I was on Facebook and one of my friends posted, uh, they said, that these four circles, right, these four different circles, and where they intersect in the middle is your ikigai. It's how the Japanese live. It's their, the way of living your life so you have meaning and purpose. And the four things are this. You need to find one thing in your life that you're good at, that pays you money, that you love, and that the world needs. And I thought, okay, that was great. I like that. I would like a bit of ikigai in my life, mm -hmm. right? But then I would use this concept with my patients and I talked to them about this. And for many of them, they just found it too intimidating. They found, yeah, man, that sounds great, but how, how am I gonna get there, right? And, and actually on the UK book tour back in January, I remember I gave a big talk in London and at the Q and A at the end, a Japanese student put a hand up and she said, Dr. Chassi, look, I'm very familiar with Ikigai. It's part of my culture. 
but I found it very stressful my whole life. It's an impossible ideal for me to live up to. Do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it, yeah. it, it's great if you can get it, but many of us don't feel we can. Yeah. And so I created a new framework in the book mm -hmm. called the Live Framework to help people start to find meaning and purpose. Um, it's like called the Live Framework, L-I-V-E, L for love, I for intention, V for vision, and E for engagement. Now, we don't necessarily need to go into the whole thing, but I think the first one is super, super interesting for people. And I think it will really shed some light onto their lives. L is for love, right? So that is about passion. So the research tells us this, Sean. It tells us that regularly doing things that we love makes us more resilient to stress. Hmm. Yeah. But conversely, being chronically stressed makes it really hard for us to experience pleasure in day-to-day -day things. Hmm. So it works both ways. Yeah. So passion is a huge part of meaning and purpose. It's a huge part of stress. It's a huge part of health. I had a patient maybe a year ago, 52-year-old chap, right? He was, the, um, he was the CFO of a plastics company local to me. And he came in to see me. And he was, he was married. He had two kids. He had a good job. You know, he was living in a pretty decent house. You know, from the outside, his life was good. But he came in to see me. He said, Dr. Chastity, look... Um, some days I kind of struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Um, my motivation's down a little bit. I feel a bit flat about things. Is this what depression is? And so I, we were chatting. I started to try and understand what was going on in his life. I ran some tests, some bloods, they were all normal. And I said, look, how's your job? Your job's okay, I mean, I don't really enjoy it, but I've got to do it, you know, I've got a mortgage, I've got a family to feed, that's why I do my job. I said, okay, how's your marriage? Yeah, so, so, I don't really see my wife that much. Yeah, I guess it's okay. Very, very indifferent. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, have you got any hobbies? What do you do in the week that you enjoy? He said, I don't really have any hobbies. I'm too busy. I said, what about the weekends? Weekends, you know, I've got to do all the house chores, household chores. I've got to take the kids to their sports classes. I don't have time, Doc, for hobbies. I said, okay, did you ever have a hobby? Yeah, you know, like as a kid, as a teenager, I used to love train sets. Mm. I said, okay, have you got a train set at home? Yeah, I've got one in the attic, but I haven't seen it in years. It's probably, it's probably dusty and, you know, got cobwebs on it. I said, look, what I'd love you to do when you get home tonight is get your train set out. Now, I fully appreciate it's probably not the advice he was expecting <laughs> from his doctor, <laughs> but that's the advice I gave to him. Anyway, I didn't see him for a few weeks, right? And that's not uncommon. We simply, we have so many patients, we can't follow everybody up. But three months later, I just finished my morning clinic. I, I was in the car park about to do some home visits for the like elderly patients who can't come into the practice. And I bumped into his wife. I said, hey, look, how's your husband getting on? She said, oh man, Dr. Chassie, I just want to say thank you. I feel like I've got the guy I married back again. He comes home from work, he plays on his toy set, on his train set, he's on eBay buying collector's items, <laughs> and he's subscribed to like some monthly magazine now. I thought, okay, that's great, I, I felt really good. I still hadn't seen him. Three months later, I was looking at my clinic list, and his name's on it. He had done some blood tests, and he was coming in to see me for the results. So I said, hey, how are you getting on compared to six months ago? He said, doc, I feel like a different person. Life is good. I've got energy, I feel motivated, and I'm concentrating much better. I said, okay, great, how's your job? My job, I love it now, I'm really getting a lot out of my job. How's your relationship with your wife? So good, it's the best it's been for years. Mm. So Sean, I'm gonna ask you a question. Did that chap, did that man have a mental health problem? I mean, he certainly had symptoms that would be consistent with a mental health problem. You know, yeah. I could have diagnosed him with something yeah. like depression, potentially. Yeah. But it's not what he really had, a deficiency of passion in his life. Mm. And when we corrected his passion deficiency, when he corrected his passion deficiency, not only does he feel better in himself, now that the job that he didn't like so much, he's enjoying and getting more out of, now his relationship's starting to improve. And this is why I'm so passionate about passion, yeah. right? We talk about health, we talk about the amount of vegetables we're eating, we're talking about the workouts we do or don't do. And of course that's important, but I want people to give passion the same priority as they will give to the number of vegetables they have on their plate, right? It is so important. So the prescription I give to people is, can you 
Give yourself a dose of pleasure every day, even if it's just for five minutes. It could be reading a book, going for a walk, listening to a podcast, right? It could be, you know, it could be coming home from work, putting on your computer, going on YouTube, finding your favorite comedian and laughing for five minutes. I don't care what it is, but that's my challenge to everybody listening to this podcast. Can you give yourself five minutes of pleasure and passion every day? And the second um, request I'd make of the audience, I know it's your audience, but if you don't mind, I, my request I'd make of them is, have a think. When was the last time you did something in your life that you really, really love? Something you did not just to post on social media, but something you did because it makes you feel good. Mm. If it's not been for a while, that's okay. But I would suggest today at some point, you look at your calendar, you make some calls, and you schedule it into your diary. Passion is important for your health. It's as important, I would argue, as any other component of your health. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this could be roller skating. This could be hula hooping. This could be uh, you know, walking your dog. This could be basketball. When we think about purpose, we tend to just immediately jump to what we do for a living, for our job. Yeah. And you just gave a great example that him doing something that he loved fed back into his work yeah. and he found greater love there as well. So please keep that in mind because we all have this opportunity to start this today. But I think it's a matter of giving ourselves permission to do something that we love, yeah. which is crazy we have to say that, but it's just like today we're so distracted and we're so, quote, busy but I'm telling you right now, there are people who are far busier than you, who are far happier because they've given themselves permission to do something that they love. For sure. Yeah. And, and you know, the reason I share these examples is I really want to make health accessible for people. I don't want people to think, oh, you know, meaning and purpose is quite lofty. It's quite, many people might feel it's quite unattainable. Like depending on where your life is currently right now, that idea of having meaning and purpose may, may be quite stressful to think about it. Mm. And I think passion is a beautiful entry point because you don't have to change anything else. Just start putting a little bit of passion into your daily life. And what you'll find is it starts to feed you. It starts to nourish you. And over the coming weeks, over the coming months, other things in your life will start to become clear. And it's like a knock-on effect. You don't have to go from zero to hero. You don't have to suddenly quit your job, find the job of your dreams, You know, find the partner of your dreams, the dream house, that's not what I'm talking about. Take these small steps and the small steps will take care of the big steps later. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Man, this is so good. And I really want to illustrate this point here and how purpose and passion translates into the re like your real tangible health. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I just sent this to somebody today. And um, I just had a conversation with him about it. It's actually Eric Thomas, ET, who was just on the show recently. And this was a new study, and this was published. This is a, actually a brand new study. This wow. is nuts. Wait, where do you hear this? Brand new study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, Current Open. It uncovered that people who didn't have a strong life purpose, which for them this was defined as a self-organizing life aim that stimulates goals for them, right? That's a very tangible way to put yeah. uh, purpose in mind. And so here's what they found. These folks who didn't have a strong life purpose were more likely to die than those who had a specific uh, life purpose and die specifically from cardiovascular diseases. Now, here's how it translated to be. This study included 7,000 American adults between the ages of about 50 to 60. They found that people without a strong life purpose were more than twice as likely to die over the course of the four-year study period compared to those who had one. This is nuts, right? So again, this isn't causation, but this is a very interesting correlation. And it's something that matters, you know, because we're talking about invoking something that does, it's a stress solution. And we understand today, thanks to you, how detrimental stress can be. And so we have to incorporate something that we love. Give yourself permission, not just for your own mental health and well-being and happiness, but literally this can protect your life. Yeah, Sean. Sure. Please do send me that study as well. I'd love to see it after this podcast. I, that sounds super, super interesting. The, the point that also came to, to my, into my head as you were just describing that is, you know, guys, look, I guess a lot of people will be listening to your show and trying to get tips on their well-being. They want to improve the way that they're feeling, improve their diet, improve other aspects of their health. What you will find is when you start to engage in regular passion, you will find it gets easier 
to make those other decisions. You'll find it easier to make healthy food choices because it will, it nourishes such a crucial part of us that actually then we will feel less of a need to compensate and, and actually soothe the stresses in our life with sugar and chips. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's all connected. And hey, could there be, I wouldn't say an easier, but a more inspiring tip to do? Do something that you love, right? Yeah. It's not like you have to do something you don't like. We're, we're asking you guys to do something that you love. Whatever it might be. Whatever it is. Right? It could be some weird stuff too. If you're like super into the Smurfs, you yeah. know, like my man was in into trains and it just like lit up his life. Twerk classes, whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, um, I can't believe I just said that. But you know, like the I, I, uh, the movie Hustlers just came out, so it jumped into my mind. Jennifer Lopez, shout out. So if you're trying to do a pole dancing class, if it's you're into shoes and you just want to study all the Jordans and just there's so many things that might speak to your soul. If it's music, just give yourself permission. Add yeah. it in every day. This is so awesome. So one of the things that you talk about in the book, and this was a really interesting study that you noted. And I want to talk about, I think this is one of the most powerful tools that we have access to that we're not utilizing. Uh, it was a 2012 study, you noted, that was, if we change the way we think about a stressful event, we can improve our physical health and also the way our brain reacts to these micro stress doses. And what the study was, it compared the group of folks who didn't reframe their stress and the participants in the study who reframed their micro stress doses, so thinking about them differently, because the stress, micro stress doses happen to everybody, but reframing them, they had lower blood pressure, higher attention levels, and even improved their efficiency of their heart muscles. Nuts. It right? is nuts. It's and this is why I'm such a huge fan of daily reframing practices. So yeah. people look. We've got something called negativity bias as humans, right? This is probably what's kept us alive and for, and survive for so long. You know, we always turn our attention to the negative. So, you know, at the end of your day, you know, if you've had a stressful day and a busy day and you think about it, often the negative stuff will come up. Oh, you know, what happened? Or someone, someone ignored me in the corridor at work or, you know, whatever. Someone bumped into me in the cafe and they were rude or the waitress wasn't that nice. Whatever it is, we come back to the negatives. And there are so many beautiful things that you can do in the, in the evening that don't take long, that can just reframe the day for you. And as you said with that study, when you reframe, actually it changes the way your brain processes things. So mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing I do, Sean, with my um, family, like when I'm at home and I make it a huge priority that obviously I'm in LA at the moment, but when I'm back in the UK and I'm in my house, we all sit and have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And there's no technology there. So it's a big thing for us. And we play a little game. And the game we play is that everyone has to go around the table and answer three, well, it used to be three questions, it's now five questions, but I'll start with the three questions to keep it super simple. What have I done today to make somebody else happy? What has somebody else done today to make me happy? And what have I learned today? Now, it's such a powerful game, but I actually thought this is gonna be really good for my kids. Mm -hmm but it's actually really good for my wife and I as well. Mm, yeah. Because you, you, very, you very quickly start to reframe the day. You start to look at the positive things and there is positive in every single day if we can start training our mind to look for it. So the practice is about training yourself every day to start looking at the positives. A few months ago, my daughter said to me, hey daddy, you know, at school today, Annabelle opened the door for me on the way out to lunch break. You know, that's a small thing. I very much hope that what I'm doing by that is not only improving my own health, but I'm also modeling to my children. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that actually they're starting to learn on a daily basis. Let's start looking at the positives that happen in, in everyday life. So that's one game that people might find useful. Um, if you've had a negative experience in the day, right? A great way to reframe it is to actually write it down. Like if you start writing it down, it's very hard to be as critical to yourself as when you keep it in your head. In our head, we can make it, we can turn it into a big thing. As soon as you start writing it down, you start to realize how ridiculous some of the self-critical behavior can be sometimes. Mm -hmm. It sounds, it just sounds silly when you write it out and you can start to be a lot more rational. The other way you can try and do it, and this is another tip for people, if they struggle with negative experiences and they can't switch off from it. And these practices also help, help our sleep quality, which you yeah. well know. Right. But 
Another one is to imagine you are a commentator on your life. Like if you're a, like in a sports game that people are watching, there's a commentator, right? You guys call them commentators here as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you're a commentator. <laughs> imagine you are commentating on your life. So let's say you have your boss, there was a meeting with your boss and something negative happened. In your own head, you can turn this into something that it never was. But on the, if you pretend you're a commentator and you also write it down, you say, okay, so I came to that meeting, actually, my boss was actually super tired. He's not performing well today because his kids weren't doing so well. That's why he's tired. That's why he didn't really look at me and give me the attention. It wasn't because of the way I was feeling. Look, some of these tips may resonate with people. Some of them won't. Choose the ones that do resonate with you. I will say that that gratitude practice that I play with my family is fantastic. A lot of my friends now, sometimes we'll play it with my friends when we're out for dinner. We'll play it together. It sounds a little bit... It sounds a little bit California, right? Mm -hmm. But it's great and it's so powerful. Yeah, I love that. If that conversation resonated with you, here is another incredibly powerful one that I really think you're going to enjoy. Give it a click and let me know what you think. We shouldn't apply that same sledgehammer approach to these chronic diseases that actually have got lifestyle as a root cause. That's going to have an impact on your alertness, on your mental functioning, on your mood. But it's more than that.